Timothy this morning, chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're looking at the subject this morning of remembrance, remembering. He uses that phrase several times, and it goes along with our theme this year. Our, our theme this year is thy kingdom come, and we're talking about God's kingdom and our family. Uh, we need the Lord to be the Lord of our home. Uh, we need his kingdom to be ruling over our homes. And I want to encourage you this morning. God can do that and give you the kind of home you, you really want. 2 Timothy chapter 1, let me read starting in verse 1. We'll just read down through verse 7. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Remembering things. Now, sometimes there's things you want to forget, and you can't. Sometimes there's things you'd like to remember. Yeah, you know the old thing, you tie a string on your finger, and, and it reminds you, oh, there's something I'm supposed to remember. What is it? And we probably all walked into a room and thought, now why did I come into this room? I know there was something I was going to do. Uh, memory is a very odd thing. Uh, Doyle sometimes will talk about something we've done, and I'll say, now, are you sure I was there? Yeah, you were there. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's funny what we remember. Uh, Joel sent me a picture for our anniversary. Uh, you'll see it next week. Of me sitting right here, singing in a barbershop quartet. I don't remember doing that, but there's a picture of it, so I must have done it. I've, either that or I have an evil twin somewhere. Uh, it's an odd thing, memory, isn't it? Uh, sometimes there's things we, uh, we remember because they were so vivid to us. Other times they're, they're a bit vague. I found it interesting that Paul actually wrote this, this letter from prison. And you know, he could have spent a lot of time feeling sorry for himself, couldn't he? In chapter 1, verse 16, uh, he says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he offered refreshed men, was not ashamed of my chain. He was chained up. He was in a dungeon. And... Uh, Yet, that wasn't what he was focusing on. He was focusing on writing to Timothy. In uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. You know, he could have he been writing a real sob story to Timothy, couldn't he? But no, he was, he was happy in the Lord, and uh, his memory would not just be of, of bad things. Uh, you know, you need to stop and ask yourself, what do you remember? What is it your life focuses on? Uh, I know people who had some bad thing happen to them, and man, that's their favorite thing. It, it's like their pet toy. You know, every once in a while, they, they pull that thing out of memories, the cupboard of memory, and, and boy, they just stroke it, and they go over that terrible thing, that, you know, that bad thing that happened to them. Uh, listen, that's not where you want to focus your memories. Uh, there's so much good that God has done for us. We need to be grateful people. Let me ask you this. What will people remember about you? <coughs> Man, uh, there's sometimes, like I said, memory is a funny thing. Every once in a while, something will pop into my mind, and I'll think, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry I did that. I'm so sorry I said that. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, you know, there's somebody who's going to, there's some people in life who the only thing they're going to know about me is that I cut them off in, in traffic or, you know, some bad thing that I did or said. Uh, what will people remember about us? What memorial will we leave? And uh, we're looking at this on Mother's Day because Mother's Day is, is a remembrance. For some of us, uh, it's for, of mothers that have, have gone on. Uh, for others, it's mothers that we live in, live in the same house with. House with. But uh, Paul is, is looking here at motivating a spiritual son. Now, Paul was not a mother, all right? He talks about some mothers there as we get down further. Uh, but he uses three, uh, three times, he uses the word remembrance. And uh, I thought... Now, this would be something we need to look at this morning as we think about Mother's Day. In verse 3, he uses the word, first of all, when he says, 
I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul is saying to Timothy, I remember you. I know you. And uh, he, he, uh, he had a relationship with, with Timothy. Paul was his spiritual father, you might say. And I find it interesting that in, in starting the book, or the letter, I should say, he uses some words of command. He uses the word in verse 1, apostle, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul is an apostle. That has authority. And, you know, in the home, uh, there has to be authority. Uh, with mothers and fathers, God has given them authority in the home. Uh, it's not a democracy. <laughs> you know, I can often remember, uh, you know, uh, saying to my dad, uh, I don't really want to do that. He said, well, I'm not really asking you. <laughs> Uh, it, it wasn't a democracy. I didn't get to vote, you know. And uh, if I didn't respond, I'd, I would be taxed. Uh, he, he didn't actually tax me, but he, he, he did uh, motivate me. Uh, Paul is an apostle and has authority. Well, listen, in our homes, there has to be authority. It can't just be a bunch of people all living in the same house. Uh, mothers and fathers have authority that comes from God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, he tells children... Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first suggestion, no, <laughs> which is the first commandment with promise. God says there's to, there's to be authority in the home. Uh, Paul as well talks there in verse 1 about the will of God. Paul, uh, by the will of God. You know, as, as Christians, that's what we're looking for is the will of God. And the same is true in our home. The, the way you're going to have a happy home is by knowing the will of God. And each person has to be seeking the will of God. There's a, a verse in Romans, I'll just read it to you, uh, Romans 14, 12, where he says, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us is going to give an account to God. You know, as a child, you might think, oh, I, I can just have fun. I'm, I'm just a child. Well, listen, someday you're going to give an account. What you've said, what you've done, how you've treated your parents. Parents, you're going to give an account of whether you've taken the responsibility that God gave you. you know, being a mother is, is a, can be a joy. Uh, it can be a trial. Uh, but it's also a responsibility. And uh, God calls us to do the, the best we can. And you know, when, uh, if we want to know God's authority and we want to know God's will, uh, we need to go to God's word. That's the way to know God's will. Uh, that's where we should point our home, is to God's will. I remember when I was about six, it must have been. I have two brothers. Uh, one is six years older than me. One's eight years older than me. They must have had an argument, and uh, one of them called the other a fool. And my dad immediately took the Bible and showed him in the Bible, you're not to call your brother a fool. And that stuck in my mind. I was only a six-year-old kid. That stuck in my mind, you know, that not only that dad knew where it was, but that that's what he did. And, you know, that's the way a home should run. That's the authority. It's not just that I'm bigger and stronger, so you got to do what I say. It's that God says there's an authority in the home. There's a, there's a will of God. You know, a family needs a foundation, and that's God's authority. Uh, God started the family. Family isn't something that just came up because people needed somewhere to live. Uh, the best start for you is to submit, for you to submit to God's authority. Now, you might be a child, you might be an adult, you, uh, whatever. You need to submit to God's authority. That will help your home. That will make your home a better place. Uh, Paul uses words of command. We need that in the home. But you know what? He uses a lot more words of love. In verse 2 there, he says, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Uh, he, he loved Timothy. Timothy loved him. You know, we live in a world that has distorted the idea of love. Uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, I found this interesting. Uh, he says, now the end of the commandment is charity. Isn't that interesting? The end of the commandment is, is love. The best way to love people is to submit to God's authority and love the Lord. And uh, as Paul talks to Timothy there, uh, he uses a, a lot of things that show his love for him. You know, our home needs that. It's interesting how often we'll think in our mind how much we love somebody and not say it. 
and not show it. Now, kids need to hear their parents say, I love you, I appreciate you, I admire you. Kids, you, you need to say, the, say words of, of love and kindness to your parents. Uh, in, in verse 2, he shows his concern for him. You know, Paul's concern for Timothy was that Timothy would be the best he could be for the Lord. Uh, he said to him, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. Paul wanted Timothy to have the, the best he could have from the Lord. Uh, Timothy wasn't uh, a nuisance to him. Uh, he was a blessing. He was concerned for him. He appreciated him. I thank God. Uh, you know, we, we need to be able to tell each other uh, that we're thankful uh, for each other. He said he prayed for him. Uh, what a blessing it is to have someone say, I've prayed for you today. Um, as, as parents and as, as people of responsibility, we need to be praying for our children. Children, you need to be praying for your parents. Uh, it's not easy. In verse 4, he shows his affection, greatly desiring to see thee. You know, it's a sad thing that in, in many homes, people are just so glad to get out of them. I've known people get married so they can get out of their home, you know. Now listen, that's not a good motivation. Um, you, you'll find it, it may boomerang on you. Uh, he, he had affection for him, and, and he told him that. And then he had trust for him. Verse 5, I call to remembrance your unfeigned faith and, and your walk with the Lord. Um, and all of those need to relate to our, our family. We need to be expressing uh, sure, as parents, we need to be in command. We need to follow God's authority. Children need to follow God's authority. But we also need to have words of love. We need to be saying to each other that we appreciate each other. Now, Paul wasn't a mother, but he loved Timothy like a son. There's a, a passage in 1 Thessalonians 2 where he says something to the Thessalonian church. Let me read it. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. He says, We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You know, what an attitude he had toward, uh, toward other believers, towards Christians. And you know, that, that should certainly be in our home, shouldn't it? You know, as, as parents, uh, listen, we'd give our life for our kids. Uh, I hope that's true, and I hope it goes the other way as well. You know, he wasn't just giving words to them. He wasn't just giving things to them. Listen, our kids don't need things. They need us. They need us to love them and to, to live the, the Christian life before them. Your home needs you to rely on God's authority. Your home needs you to express God's love. Listen, if, you're, if your family can't see God's love through you, where are they going to see it? If they can't see it through you, where are they going to see it? I mean, really, who's going who's gonna to show them the love of God if we won't? Uh, we need command. Uh, sometimes we need rebuke. But you know, that's not all we need. We don't just need command and rebuke. Unfortunately, for some parents, that's all they say to their kids. Stop doing that. Go do this. <laughs> uh, our kids need to know that, that we love them. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love. Now, we need to express love. I found over the years, people take a lot from someone that they know loves them. If you know somebody loves you, you'll put up with their mistakes. And listen, parents will make mistakes. They'll, they'll pick the wrong kid for starting the fight, you know? Uh, it, it's always the kid that hits back that gets caught, by the way, uh, just in case you kids didn't know that. Um, it, we'll take a lot from somebody we know loves us. And uh, that's a key. God's word, God's authority gives you the basis for love in your home. And I hope, I think most of us want that. We want a lovely home. Uh, so Paul was able to say, first of all, I know you, Timothy. I remember you. I know you and I love you. Not only that, in verse uh, 5, he uses the word remembrance. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in you. He said, I not only know you, I not only remember you, I remember your heritage of faith. And there's a couple of words I want to emphasize here. One is the word unfeigned. Unfeigned means not fake. It means real. And the other is the word dwelt. Dwelt. Paul, uh, Timothy's faith was unfeigned. And you know, that, that home, as you read about it there in verse 5, he says, it first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. Each one of those had real faith. You see, faith has to be an individual thing. 
It's not just, oh, my family's Christian. Oh, my family's this, my family's that. What are you? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you know Christ? As someone has said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. You can't say, well, I'm a Christian because my parents are Christian. No, you have to trust Christ as your Savior. Uh, unfeigned faith means it's real. And it, that starts with salvation. Uh, later on, 2 Timothy 3.15, he writes to Timothy, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now how could he know the Scriptures from a child, except his grandmother and his mother had been presenting it? But then at some point, he had to respond to it. Not everyone does. Some people grow up in a Christian home and they say, I'm out of here. But many receive Christ as Savior because their parents lived and said the Word of God. You see, uh, faithfulness to the Lord starts with salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, he says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's by faith. And it continues, unfeigned faith continues with a life of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God's word has to be applied to every area of life. It has to be applied to marriage. Listen, living together is not marriage. We can talk about partners all we want. Uh, it doesn't make it a marriage. God's standard is marriage. Uh, family, you know, we can, we can do whatever we want in family, but if we're going to go to God's authority... That's where the blessing will be. And as Christians, we'll look for, how does God want us to live? With work. Do you know the Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat? Man, that's pretty serious. Uh, God says we're not to just live off uh, of others and, and to expect others to, to support us. Uh, we're to work. We're to have character. I, I've seen parents teach their children to lie. Tell them I'm not home. And then they're surprised when they have bad character. Yeah, I've, I've talked to parents where they complain about their, their kids and my thought, and sometimes I've said it, oh, who raised them? Boy, it's a pity you let those, somebody else raise them so poorly. Uh, listen, our kids are going to turn out the way we raise them. They need to see godly living in the home. And when we're wrong, you know the best thing you can tell your kids? I'm sorry, I was wrong. Very important words. Uh, Timothy grew up in a home where he not only heard the word of God, he saw it lived. And that's what we need. We need a faith that is unfeigned, a heritage that's real. Now, I, I learned that no matter how much you water a fake plant, it won't grow. <laughs> uh, we were at Doyle's mom's house, and uh, her aunt had gone away, and it was my job to go and water the plants. Man, every day, I, there was one that I watered all the plants, but there was one of my water that didn't make a bit of difference. It was plastic. <laughs> And uh, listen, you can come to church, you can do all the things that Christians do, but until you know Christ as your Savior, uh, you're not going to have that real faith. It's got to be individual. It's got to be you that trusted Christ as Savior. Um, there was a woman who was trying to impress the pastor. You know, the pastor had come for a visit, and so she said to her daughter, "Hun, go and get that book that Mom loves to read. And uh, so her daughter came back with a sales catalog. <laughs> she didn't come back with the Bible uh, because her, her faith... <laughs> wasn't being shown in, in the home. There's no such thing as a genuine imitation. Uh, we need to be the real thing. That was what was happening in Timothy's home. He saw it from his mother. He saw it from his grandmother. And, and he believed it himself. The, the other word I wanted you to see there is the word dwelt. Uh, in verse 5, which dwelt. God's word has to dwell in us. We have to dwell in the Lord. Uh, there's a couple of verses in Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I'll just read the first part. But Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's what we need. God dwelling in us. And us dwelling in Him. The word dwell means be at home. You know, there are strangers that if they wandered into your house and made themselves at home, you'd be a little bit upset. Uh, but there's other people, man, they come in, they're at home. And uh, that's the way it should be. We should be at home with the Lord. We should dwell. His word should dwell in us, and, and we should, should dwell in Him. In fact, really, as Christians, we should be uncomfortable in the world. Uh, there's, there's times when things will happen, and, and you'll think, oh, 
Uh, that makes me very uncomfortable. Listen, it shouldn't be Christian things. It should be the ungodly things. Uh, let me read you a verse from 2 Corinthians. Uh, let's see, where am I? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. He says, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Listen, when, when the world says, uh, we're going we're gonna to change the definition of marriage, that should make us uncomfortable. We shouldn't be happy with that. Uh, when, when they persecute a person for quoting the scripture, uh, I'm real tempted to put uh, on our sign out here, join in the persecution of Christians. Who are they to quote the Bible? Who do they think is talking? God? <laughs> I may or may not do that, but uh, li listen, we should be uncomfortable when people uh, ridicule and, and uh, deny the name of God. We should be dwelling, uh, we should be comfortable with the things of God. Uh, we shouldn't be deciding every week, oh, should I come to church this week? No, that should just be a given. We should be comfortable doing the, the Christian things. See, what you do will affect those who come behind you. What you do. Don't make those who come behind you have to recover from you. I meet people all the time who are trying to recover from their parents and their grandparents and beyond. Don't, don't let that be your testimony. Live for the Lord as best you can. You'll never, none of us will ever always do it right. But we can, we can look to the Lord and let Him dwell in our hearts and dwell in Him. Uh, what will people remember about you? Paul was able to say, Timothy, I remember you. I love you. I remember your heritage of faith. Not only you, but your family. Um, then he said to him in, in verse uh, 6, the last remembrance, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He says, Timothy, there's some things you need to remember. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember that as a Christian, you need to live for the Lord. Now, to stir something up, you've got to have it. <laughs> I don't know if any of you remember that. They used to have yogurts where the yogurt was on the top and the flavor was at the bottom. Do you remember those? There was fruit at the bottom. If you didn't stir it up, you ended up with just fruit at the bottom. You had to stir it up to get that, that flavor going there. But you know what? It had to be there. And for you to stir up the gift of God, number one, you need to be saved. Hey, it's not just excitement we're looking for. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of God in our lives. You need to ask yourself, are you saved? God writes in, in 1 John chapter 5, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. See, so we can know we're saved by the Word of God. If we're not living the Word of God, uh, we need to stop and ask ourselves, have I entered the kingdom of God? Have I been born again? Stir it up. Let salvation work in you. Uh, listen, it's a good work that God is doing. The, the gospel is the good news. It's not the bad news. And uh, we need to stir up uh, the salvation that God has given to us. If you're saved, listen, live it. And if you're saved, the Holy Spirit has given you a spiritual gift to use for Him. Uh, did you know that? Every Christian has, you know, different people have different theories, but at least one spiritual gift that God has given you to use for others. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. We might have different gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit. Later on, he says, all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing every man severally as, as he will. That word severally means particularly. God gives you a specific gift. He doesn't just throw out a bunch of gifts and whatever lands on you, that's, that's what happens. He says, no, now here's brother so-and-so, let's give him this gift. Here's sister so-and-so, let's give her that gift. And he picks it out particular. And it's a blessing to us because we can use it then in, in the ministry. God's, God says that the body is not one member but many. And he compares our work together as a body. Listen, this hand can hardly do anything for itself. You know, it can't even hardly scratch itself, but the other can, other hand can. My back can, can't scratch itself, but my hand can. And that's, that's what he's talking about. Stir up the gift in you. You're to be a blessing to other Christians. Now, let salvation work in you. Now, use the gift that God's given you. Use it in your home. Use it in your church. But not only stir up the gift, stir up the power of God. 
Aren't you tired of living a powerless life? Aren't you tired of just living a life that you're going to live and die and, and nothing ever happens? Why not look to the power of God? That's what he says there in verse 7. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I know so many people who make decisions based on fear. Oh, I can't do that. What would people think? Remember when our kids were little, I'd, I'd do something silly in an elevator or something. Dad, Dad, what will people think? We don't care what they think. <laughs> we'll never see them again. <laughs> I would say, uh, we, don't, don't make decisions in your life based on fear. That doesn't come from the Lord. But the Spirit of God gives you, he gives you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. God's power is enough for you to do what God calls you to do. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. God's love is enough. You know, there's, they say a lot of people are looking for love. Well, listen, God sent love. God is love. God has love. In Ephesians 5, he says, Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. We can walk in love because Christ has loved us. In Galatians 5.22, he says, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so on. Now stir up the power of God. Did you know the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? Uh, we, we can have the, the Spirit of God's mind through, through His Word. We can know uh, what to think and what to do. In John 8.32, he says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What a blessing. So some things of, of remembrance. This is Mother's Day. I hope you have some good memories of your, your mother. Uh, those of you who are mothers, I hope you're making good memories for, for your kids. Those of you who will be mothers, listen, uh, plan ahead. Uh, be a good mom. Uh, they, they say, uh, you know, be good to your kids. They're, they're going to choose your nursing home. Uh, mother's Day. There's a lot of remembrance involved there. Uh, but here was a family that passed faith in God on from mother, the mother's name was Lois, to the daughter, her name was Eunice, to the grandson, Timothy. They were people who, who lived for the Lord. Each, in each case, their faith had to be genuine. Lois had to have genuine faith in God. Eunice had to have genuine faith in God. Same with Timothy. When God called him to minister, he couldn't just say, well, what would Granny do? What would mom do? No, he had to go to the Lord himself. He had to have faith in Christ. Maybe you have a Christian heritage. Uh, my testimony is that uh, when my parents were young teenagers, before they were married, they, they were just kids, an evangelist came to town, and my grandparents got saved. And their family, most of them got saved. They trusted Christ as their Savior. Before that, it was a non-Christian family. But after God came into their home, they were Christians. Uh, the oldest brother was away at university. He came back. He, he thought they'd gone crazy. He eventually got saved and became a, a pastor. He, his name is my middle name. Um, that's my heritage. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather were the first, like he says, which dwelt first. There has to be somebody who's first. If you have a Christian heritage, it means somebody went before and trusted Christ and, and lived for the Lord. But let me say this. You still need to trust Christ as your Savior. Just because your parents are saved doesn't make you a Christian. Now, unfortunately, the devil has, has been very clever. And he gets some people, he, he has them do a ceremony when they're babies. They baptize babies. They don't really baptize them. They splash a bit of water on them and make them cry. Uh, they do all these little ceremonies. And so those people grow up thinking they're Christians because somebody did something to them. That's a lie of the devil. Listen, you're not saved by somebody doing something to you. You're saved by faith in Christ. And you can have, you can have a Christian heritage and still die and go to hell. That could have happened to Timothy, but Timothy trusted Christ. Now, maybe you're a person who doesn't have a Christian heritage. Uh, you know, there's, there's some pretty evil people out there. There's people who kill their kids. There's, kids. there's children who have their kids steal for them. And all kinds of terrible things. But you can be a Lois. You can be the first. 
which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. And listen, to do that, you have to step away from your family. You have to step away from your culture. God saves you out of your culture, out of your family. Uh, we were dealing, we were living in a, a place very Catholic, uh, Fremantle in Western Australia, trying to minister there. Very tribal. Very tribal. Uh, you know, people, people were, were interested because they were very religious, but they really feared trusting Christ because it would mean rejecting everything that they had learned for, sometimes for generations that was wrong. Listen, for you to be saved, you might have to be the first. You might have to be the only one who steps out and says, I'll trust Christ. And nobody else steps out with you. Let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, you won't be worried about the others. You'll just be glad you trusted Christ. Don't make a decision based on fear. Don't make it based on fear of, of what people might, might think. Um, whether you have a Christian heritage or not, you can start one. And you can be a blessing to others. You can be a Lois. You know, the Bible says all have sinned. It says all need to be saved. The wages of sin is death. And it says that we need to believe the gospel. When, uh, when the disciples were asked, what must we do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul writes, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, it's by faith in Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You need to trust Christ as your Savior. You need to believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins, that he was buried and rose again. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what a blessing. So simple. So straightforward. God is love. God is also holy. And our sin separates us from that holy God. But God in grace became a man, became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, what, a, what a love that God has shown to us. Now, let me encourage you, first of all, this morning to know that God loves you and he's made a way for you to know him. And let me encourage you as well, uh, you can trust Christ and you can live for him. And God can bless your family because of it. Uh, this morning, I want to encourage you uh, to... Do some remembering. Now remember what Christ has done for you. Remember, if you're saved, where you were and what God has done. If you're not saved, remember that Jesus is the Savior and trust Him today. We're going to take our, our song books and uh, turn to page 159. It's the song, Jesus, I Come. Jesus, I Come. And I want to encourage you this Mother's Day, if you're not saved, trust Him today. Today is the day of salvation. I'm going to be right here at the front. Uh, as we sing, maybe you need to come and have somebody show you from the Scriptures how to be saved. Uh, come and, and leave.